Well, hello and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this month's webinar on In Common Futures 2, The Conversation Continues. Thanks for joining us at today's IAM Online, the monthly webinar that's focused on identity and access management, brought to you by In Common and Internet 2. All right, that's it for me. Without further ado, I am very happy to pass the virtual mic over to Kevin Marooney. Jean's done a really good job setting the table. Um, while Jean was talking, I was watching who was coming in. I see some familiar names and also a non-trivial number of unfamiliar names as well. So uh, you'll get the full treatment um, and, and a little more than that uh, by the time we're done. We hope to be done, uh, we aim to be done about quarter to the hour. Uh, so you can ask any remaining questions, but as Jean indicated, uh, please don't hesitate to ask questions during um, and we'll be monitoring. Uh, the chats. All right, so here, here's how it's broken down. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, on just some background around Futures 2, and then we're going to tell the core of the story. Um, Mark's going to kick us off there, uh, and then I'll, I'll pick up the baton um, from there, and then uh, we'll finish with some early action areas that we've uh, identified as we get headed into action mode on the In Common Futures 2 project. So. Um, for those of you who may not have uh, been in proximity for prior versions of this conversation, you may be asking yourself, uh, what is in common futures too? Um, I made a, a, a huge mistake um, by not introducing myself or giving uh, Mark an opportunity to do that. Apologies to you all and to Mark. Uh, I'm Kevin Marooney. I'm, I do a handful of things at, at Internet2. Uh, one of them is be one of the many uh, caretakers of the thing we call in common. And Mark, who are you? I am uh, Mark Wallman. I'm Vice President for Information Technology at North Dakota State University. And uh, I guess co-conspirator with, with Kevin on this. And um, uh, you got a slide coming up that kind of shows where the whole thing got launched. It got launched at a, in a hallway conversation, really, um, that Kevin and I had. So I'll let you go on with the story here, Kevin. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Hopefully that's the last skip like that. So uh, the pithiest way to say it is that this is a project that's being un undertaken by uh, the In Common Steering Committee to help guide a vibrant future for In Common. And um, I have another slide later that has all of the committee members in it, but to give you an idea of the, the diversity and depth of, uh, of representation we have from the In Common community on the In Common Steering Committee, um, it's a really, really strong group this year. And uh, we've been walking hand in hand with steering and a good guiding hand at that. But you may be asking, if there's a Futures 2, um, maybe there there was at some time a Futures 1. All good Part 1s have a, a Part 2, and we're here to talk to you about Part 2 or Futures 2. But there was a, uh, a Futures 1 report. We just didn't call it that. We just called it the In Common Future Report and Recommendation, which was published in the summer of 2009. Uh, and this was the group uh, that was convened to author this paper. This paper um, on the last slide, these slides will be posted as an asset in the uh, I Am Online channel. Uh, but the, the, the first futures report is available on the incommon.org website uh, if you hunt around a little bit. Uh, so it's out there for your reading. These are the groups of, of people who uh, way back when in 2009 got together to chart a course for the future of In Common. And uh, In Common had a fairly slow start um, as most things do way back in 2004 when, when In Common started. Then in 2009, we had grown to 170 or so uh, entities that had, had, had connected themselves uh, to in common. And it's so one of my favorite graphs to, to think about um, in a historical context is that uh, th there were many factors going into this explosive growth, but there is no question that the people who took the time to author the report, the Internet to board, um, Internet to itself, uh, listened to the report, acted on the report, uh, invested in this nascent effort called in common. And since then, it's been uh, it's been growing and growing. Um, so the impact of the futures, you know, first futures report is, I think, um, not to be refuted. Um, 
again, this is more of an asset for afterwards, but uh, Ann West and I sat down and took all of the recommendations from that first report and did our own little Kevin and Ann scorecard. This isn't, you know, blessed by the steering committee or anything like that. Uh, but it, we, we, we made a lot of progress on, on what was uh, called out back in 2009. Um, it's important though to remember there's, there's some key differences between the intent of the first futures report and the intent of the second futures report. So the audience in the first one was Internet2 itself, the organization, and uh, the Internet2 board of trustees. While in common had some lift, it wasn't entirely clear in 2009 if in common was going to get altitude, uh, cruising altitude. Uh, as I indicated, the authors of the paper, um, which included the, the first president and CEO of Internet2, Doug Van Halling, uh, believed in the importance of Internet2 and sat down to figure out what it would take to, um, to get there. Um, before I, I turn it over to Mark, I do want to tell that little story. Um, so about a couple of years ago, uh, Internet2 had its first uh, post-pandemic event at the, the Westin Hotel in the Denver airport. Um, and it was called a, a leadership exchange. And we had not quite 100 uh, higher ed uh, leaders from regional networking organizations and campuses. Uh, and it was a good session. And uh, that ended up being the kickoff for the internet to roadmap, a five-year roadmap uh, project. And Mark was sitting on one side of the room. I was sitting on the other side of the room. And we invariably uh, got together on breaks. Mark, Mark um, uh, didn't mention that Mark is also the chair of the In Common Steering Committee. And at the first break, Mark, Mark says, wow, this is really, really uh, you know, interesting. Maybe we should do something like this. And we got to talking a little bit about In Common. Uh, and I mentioned to Mark, oh, yeah, well, you know, we did something like that back in 2009. Breaks over, go back in the room. Mark reads the report. We come back out in the second break. And the first thing Mark said to me was, we're doing that again. Uh, this, that was good stuff. Um, we, we, should, we should take a run at, at uh, developing something similar. So with that, um, we're going to head into the story. It's a story in three acts with an epilogue and, uh, uh, sorry, a prologue. And Mark is going to start us off with that. So Mark, uh, a little bit from your perspective on all this. So um, just a few other comments on kind of why I thought, why this kind of really sparked my interest at that uh, meeting um, Kevin was talking about. I, I think at the time that we were talking, I, you know, we had a number of issues before the steering committee and I knew that the, you know, we have a bunch of other committees that are all working on stuff. And um, I wasn't, you know, when I, when I realized when Kevin said we had this, this futures document back in the day, I'm like, oh, and I look at it, I'm like, this kind of gave a framework for the direction everybody should be rowing in. And, and it kind of had, without me understanding what I was thinking before that, I, I kind of had been wanting something to give us better framework for making sure all these various groups and this larger community is rowing in the same direction. And, and seeing that this there had been a pre previous futures report, it really seemed to me like this is a good time. And when you look at that from 2009, that's like 15 years ago now, which is an eternity in this industry. Um, and so it just, it felt like a very good time to be doing that to help us get kind of going in the same direction. Um, so the next, let's go to the next slide. And this is kind of about, you know, and I, I have a passion for this. I think that, that I'm speaking just more generically digital identity. Uh, we can talk identity management, get into specifics, more technical terms on that. But I think this is the most important thing that we do in higher education. Um, this is the most important service. All the other services presuppose it. Um, if you step out and look at just how our institutions operate, identity is key to that. You know, what your role is with the university. I'm, I'm a faculty member. Um, I'm an assistant professor. I'm a full professor. I'm, you know, I'm a research professor. I'm a staff member. I'm in this department. I'm in that department. All of these various things shape our identity. And there's ad hoc things. I'm on this committee. I'm on that committee. Um, so our, our, our institutions are really founded on identity and what role we play in the university. Um, not talking about any IT services really very strongly based on uh, your identity and characteristics. Um, the identity, um, the electronic parts of our institution really need to function at least as well as the non-electronic parts and where it can, it should function better. And I would argue that today we are not there. 
Um, why don't we go to the next slide? And so this is just kind of a picture of, of kind of how I'm thinking of it. I'll, I'll provide an example here. We have decisions that are made that are based on uh, identity and those result in changes uh, to particular IT services. And so just to give you an example, um, I, I remember one in particular that I'm going, man, this is stupid that we're doing this. Um, hopefully other institutions are a little better, but I suspect many are not. We had a chair, a department chair go on sabbatical and somebody else was filling in on an interim role. Well, I get an email from the president's, I get contacted from the president's office and from the provost's office about getting these people added to various groups, right? There's a there's a chairs and heads group that the provost has for all the academic chairs and heads. And there's a overall leadership group that the president has. And they need to get in probably on a mailing list and a meeting invites and this stuff. And right, so, so at least what I know, there are a few actions that had to happen that I'm aware of and probably more than I wasn't aware of to actually get this person the, their digital part of their identity to line up with their kind of role in the university. And most of that stuff was manual with emails and people doing stuff. There wasn't anything that's automatic. And um, to me, this means that the digital part of the identity isn't actually as real as the what the person's relationship with the university is. Well, why don't we go to the next slide? And I think there's a whole spectrum here uh, of different kind of levels. So some of the things um, to me, the, the, the digital part of the identity becomes more real and tangible when you can make a decision about something. You can say, okay, this is, needs to happen or this change has happened. And then it just flows through with automation to other parts of, of the university. And we have some things that are less, more like that and others that are less like that. So, um, you know, I kind of drew this out as a spectrum with different levels with kind of the most automated being um, what you would see on the right and the and the least automated being on the left. So like particular activities, name changes, a lot of those are pretty automated these days, maybe not totally. If you go to the other end, um, you know, software defined networking, not so much. Um, cross institutional provisioning and deprovisioning. So some of the stuff we're in common comes in here to play to, to span different institutions and different organizations. Um, we could, we're okay on the authentication part, but if you start going above that, that's where we kind of drop off a little bit. And so um, just kind of speaking at a very high level of abstraction, uh, this is this is kind of where I would like to see things. The more connected with our that are interconnected our systems are, the more we can make a decision and, and have stuff happen, the better. And this kind of flows to I think all of the stuff that the internet to and in common um, do. So um, why don't I pass it back to Kevin? And, and this is kind of very high level, but now Kevin's going to get into more specifics on all this stuff. Great. Thanks, Mark. And I, uh, another um, a sort of caveat, since I went back and looked at the participants list, some of you have seen some of the shtick before. Um, it, ha it has changed a little bit. Um, uh, the, the last 10 slides or so will be what you might be most interested in. But for those of you who might be seeing this for the first time, uh, I would just encourage you to pay attention because it's going to go fast. It's all interconnected. Um, and it, it takes some time to, to sit with it um, to get all of the connections eventually. So here we go. Act one, the present. So here's a way to look at what we do today. Right? We do all this. Um, we have tools to, to help do the kinds of things that Mark is talking about on a campus. We convene people to, to help them learn in the forms of things like I Am Online and Common Academy, uh, the camp series from base camp to camp to A camp. Uh, we, of course, run the In Common uh, Federation. There's the certificate service, there's the Catalyst program, there's Edge of the Room. There's a lot going on, but this, this is a way to look at sort of the product page associated uh, with In Common at Internet, too. Um, the, the context that we do all those things is really important to understand. And so <clears throat> this is arguably the center of the context, which is a now old, old, oldish, um, soon to be updated uh, reference architecture or really schematic <clears throat> for what IAM looks like at a, at a typical um, institution, uh, a you know, higher education institution. Uh, but it doesn't stop there, right? Um, you have the IEM platform that you're dealing with um, and that you've built, like Mark began to describe at North Dakota State, um, and that 
provide seamless access and you know seamless provisioning and deprovisioning of services for people as they come and go. Uh, but you also want to connect that infrastructure and those capabilities to capabilities that are provided off campus. And they could come in the form of commercially provided cloud services and university and otherwise research organization provided cloud services. Each one of those services are existing in an environment where they do IAM as well. They have to, you can't provision services in a digital context without having an IAM infrastructure. There's a chance that the, the R&E services in the proverbial R&E cloud might look a little bit like yours and maybe things will go better or more simply than it might go in the commercial spaces where they have their own IAM stack, but um, it may or may not look like the one that you're running or that higher ed tends to run. Probably don't need to go into a lot of detail on examples of cloud services in the commercial cloud. You've got a standard litany of services uh, in your service catalog um, that come from the cloud in a, either a SaaS context or a platform context. In the R&E cloud though, the services look a little bit different, right? They could be wikis and portals and repositories at other institutions, not commercial entities. So in order to take your IAM infrastructure and connect it to services and enable provisioning of services that are provided, otherwise you need something, right? You need something to connect those two things. And what you need are trust federations. Trust federations provide or are an infrastructure, provide tools, develop policies and how these all these organizations are connected to one another and how it is that they should behave. Um, and that's often fueled by, almost always fueled by a, a contractual framework as well. And that's what Incommon does, right? Incommon is a trust federation, one among about 80 um, throughout the developed world. And Incommon and all those tools and policies and contracts and the infrastructure enable you to connect your IAM infrastructure uh, to services provided elsewhere. But why, why the two connections? Well, your commercial federation, if, if you belong to such a thing, de determines what goes into your cloud, into their cloud. The r &E cloud services are generally are of no interest to the commercial uh, providers. They, they don't make money. They're not designed to make money. They're designed to place a, play a role in someone's scholarship. Uh, and r &E can can sort of define what those services are in the cloud for themselves. Um, so you have a little more control in terms of what the services um, would be in the r and &E cloud versus the commercial cloud. So this is the context uh, it, around everything that we do. Uh, so we do all of this, all of these things, the convening, the learning, the catalyst, certificates, edge room, et cetera, and we do it in this particular context. So that's the end of the first part of the story to kind of level set everybody on what it is we currently do and the context in which we do it. The second act uh, starts 10 years ago to the year. Um, I had a different job at a different organization at a, at a large you know, comprehensive public research institution. And I was having trouble um, because I would go to meetings like Mark was talking about the president's council or provost team or whatever. And somebody would invariably say that IT stinks. And, uh, and I, got to the point where I said, well, I better understand what they mean by that. So I would chase people down after the meeting. And, and one time when I asked somebody why IT stinks, it was the vice president for student affairs and they had a problem with an application that wouldn't install quite right on their iPhone, um, which was interesting uh, for their context as to why IT wasn't doing what it should. And uh, another example was chasing down the, the, the director of the of physical plant who was looking for data, but couldn't find it related to how it is his team and colleges were managing the turf grass research facility, right? He couldn't get the data that he wanted. So um, everybody has a different definition of, of IT. And the way I tried to answer this question around campus was that it's not one thing, it's three things. It's technology, it's information technology, and it's information. And the more I thought about it today, not 10 years ago, it start, started to look like the history of higher, higher education IT, and in some ways, the changing role of, of the university CIO. So I make the claim that I, I can't see the precise dates that I have here, but roughly in the 90s, it was all about technology. You were digging ditches, you were talking to people in hard hats, you were pulling fiber between buildings and multi-campus systems, you're pulling it between campuses. Um, you were buying stuff, um, big expensive stuff in many cases. 
and, and deploying it. And, and it was a kind of arms race and it was very exciting. It was a great time to be connected to all this and to be alive and, and working. Uh, and then the, the decade after that, it was more about what I'm self-defining as IT. And then really it's more software-ish, right? So that becomes web service provisioning. Um, it could be a portal, right? Campus portals were a big thing. Um, you, you needed databases on the back end. Um, but this was the explosion or the beginning of the explosion of software. And I would make the argument that somewhere between 2010 and 20, perhaps 2015, that really the game is all about getting information in the hands of people who need it. So the game, it, you know, 20, 25 years ago was technology. The game, you know, 10 years subsequent to that was about the information technology. And now I think it looks like this. You are doing your job if you're putting decision makers in a position to get the information they need when they need it, which is related to the provisioning example that Mark gave, actually. Um, you still have to do the technology bits and the information technology bits. It's become thankless. In 1993, you were a hero for building the network. In 2023, the network is assumed to be there and always up, right? So you still have to do those kinds of things. Um, but that isn't what you get credit for, for doing your job. It's about getting that information in the hands of people who need it. So the notion is keeping your job is doing the technology and information technology. Doing your job is getting the information in the hands of decision makers. Hope that made sense because that's a big part of the tie-in. Uh, act three is the report itself. Uh, so this is the sort of splash page, landing page uh, for the In Common Futures 2 report. This serves as a kind of executive summary. You can boil it all down to its essence by looking at this infographic. Um, at the top third of the page, it's a description of how it is we'll, we'll go about achieving the what in the middle part of the page. And then uh, in the, the what, the, the manner by which we uh, accomplish these things or head into these directions needs to take those contexts um, into consideration. So when it, hopefully when everybody reads the report, they're focusing in on these five strategic objectives in terms of what it means um, about what we're going to do differently, how we're going to do things differently. I have read this report uh, many, many, many times. I playfully say I'd I've probably read it more than anyone. And I had to read it many times because it's it's got a lot of touch points to it and it's got a lot of interaction within itself. And for me, it boils down to two things, knowledge and communication, the creation of knowledge, uh, insight, and its dissemination. There isn't a third thing here in the overlap. It's just sometimes knowledge and communication uh, can look like the same thing. So examples of knowledge, insight, synthesis, wisdom, guidance, the sharing of expertise, which kind of then starts to look like communications. Communication can take the form of reference materials, expression of trends, provocation to action, either with a, a standards body or with ourselves or with a vendor, the sharing of best practices, advocacy for any one of a number of things, and just good old storytelling to help people understand what it is we're trying to do with all this stuff. So I boil the, the, the report down to this, the creation of knowledge um, and its dissemination. So tying it all together, let's see, we're about 1.30. We're probably gonna be done in about 10 minutes or so. I haven't seen any questions yet. Feel free to ask questions along the way, but in about 10 minutes, we'll have that awkward pause as you wait to conjure your, your courage to, to ask some questions. Uh, so in tying it all together, we, we need to take what we do, act one, right? We need to extract, create new and different value in what we do in the context that we do it in this manner that the Futures 2 report um, is guiding us to do. This is a really important, this has been a really important point um, to get in people's heads, both staff, you know, those of us who, who work at Internet 2 and in common, but also in helping uh, community members who depend on all those services and capabilities what we're really trying to do here, this is not about adding a little spice to the meal, changing it a little bit, sort of temporarily, ephemerally. It's about establishing new sort of launch coordinates for the thing we call in common to get to a fundamentally new place. So the change is subtle at first, but it is, it is meant to be and intended to be profound by the end. 
So it's not salt on the on dinner. It's actually establishing a whole new course for what it is we do. And here's one way to think about this shift and what it means to us. So here's the context in which we do all of our things today. And we tend to aim what we do at in common itself and all of its services to guide it, to, to take care of it, to nurture it, to curate it. Uh, when I was first building these slides, I, you know, I go to the incommon.org website and I'm hunting around for a few different assets and ideas. And I noticed that there were uh, 771 uh, different higher education institutions connected to the Incommon Trust Federation. All right. And a very conservative estimate informed by having done now, uh, I think, five base camps. So for the last five years, we've been doing base camps, average about 120, 130 people. And we do some light surveying when we get those people together um, for that, that long and important week in June. And I, I, very conservatively, conservatively, I would estimate that there are the equivalent of three FTE on all of those campuses uh, working in IAM. So you multiply 771 times three and you get over 2000 people who are trying to do what Mark described on their campuses and connect what they build on their campuses to those cloud capabilities. So how is it that we take the knowledge that we create and disseminate it differently? Don't aim it at the thing itself, but aim it to the army of people who are trying to do the same things. The target for our knowledge creation needs to change. Um, so the audience is changing. That means the needs for, for, for the knowledge that we create are also changing. So the knowledge changes and the manner by which we communicate it changes. Aim the goodness that we create at the army, not just the thing itself. So that's the story in three acts. Um, for those of you who may have started multitasking intensely and you're not paying attention anymore and you've already seen this five times or even two times, this is the new stuff. Um, this is our, uh, our very early take on how it is this is all going to distill in work streams or action areas uh, for the folks that work in In Common. And, and just recently, Mark got us some time on the In Common Steering Committee agenda to flush these things out. So this is how we put it into action. I'm going to start way back at the very beginning uh, when we started the entire project, the in entire Futures 2 project. Um, uh, through relationships that Gene had before coming to, to Internet2, we were able to identify a fabulous partner um, to help us with this planning exercise called Second Muse. They were outstanding to work with. They developed a really good process. Uh, the processes were very professionally run. Uh, I was and remain amazed at how quickly they understood the complexity of what we do, how we do it, the community we serve, et cetera. Um, they really were excellent to work with. I'm not going to go into these at all, um, but in the beginning of the, of the planning process, we developed principles to help us design the processes along the way. We took these principles very seriously. And if you read them and you've been around a while, these are also basically the principles um, that we've been using for 20 years um, to, help, to help build everything. So starting way back in June of 23, we started the project in earnest doing these five bullet points, facilitated sessions, stakeholder interviews, uh, a survey instrument, uh, environmental scan, et cetera. And that took us from roughly uh, June to October. And then we took our very rich, um, very interconnected advising uh, ecosystem in the form of all these committees. So Mark mentioned, you know, we have all these committees. I think it was three words. Um, but it's a lot of committees and it's a lot of people. And we, we took the first iterations of the report um, and passed it through the lenses of all the people that serve on these committees. And you know, don't expect anybody to, you know, to, to memorize this or, or, or take it in other than to see how many people um, convene monthly with or without the Futures 2 report to help us get our services and the future of in common right in other cases, but all these minds um, and, and all this passion was directed at uh, iterating on the report once we had that um, first version way back in, in uh, fall, early winter uh, last year. And of course, we, we also worked um, very closely and iteratively with the staff who do the work as well. So we've got voice and foot uh, fingerprints 
um, all, all the right ones that, that we need to, to get, to hopefully get this right. So, so I want to share with you a, a guiding perspective on how we're going to get started here. So, um, sometimes I think about things along these very simplistic terms. So you are somewhere, right? You're present, you're doing things, you have capabilities and you've got a, a, a place or destination where you're going to be because you're, you know, you're heading in a direction, you've got momentum, uh, you've got speed and you're going to end up in a particular place. If you want to change that, you have to change the destination. And that means going to a new place. And the temptation for me when I read the report the first 10 times was to try to draw a straight line from where we are to where it is that we want to be. And I found it exceedingly difficult. So the framing that we're using in, as we get started here is that, excuse me, we need to get going now right? The future is now kind of thing. Uh, but we don't know enough yet to go in a straight line to where we want to go. So let's get headed in that direction and constantly check ourselves to make sure we, we're getting to the right places. So the slides I'm going to share with you that we, that we discussed with the Income Steering Committee a couple of weeks ago um, are born out of this philosophy, if you will. Um, we don't know if this was are precisely the right set of activities, but we are confident they are the right activities to get us going in the right direction at the right velocity to eventually get um, to that right uh, that, that place where we want to be. So here are the five um, uh, strategic objectives again. And I haven't talked a whole lot about this, but if you re read the report, um, I would spend a little bit of time and attention on this, which is a recommendation um, by Second Muse mostly on a process that we could uh, employ uh, in each one of these activity areas. So we're going to experiment uh, with new project methodology, not project management methodology, but project methodology as we get started here. So over the next 18 months, we want to demonstrate all these things. We want to demonstrate value through action and new messaging, uh, the impact, our current impact, our desired future impact. Uh, in order to do that shift, that one example shift, right, with those that army of 2,313 people, we need to change the way we think about openness and transparency and reporting out and mechanisms to reach and positively influence those 2,000 people and, and more. We want to be clear and explicit and intentional about the uh, benefiting core mission of higher education institutions, by and large, research and teaching. Um, uh, and also the IAM communities themselves that build the infrastructures to enable all that. And necessarily, in order to build an effective IAM infrastructure, whether it's you know local, uh, you know domestic, or international, you need to understand who's using it, uh, not from an IT perspective, but from um, sort of a business owner uh, objective. So there are five activity areas that we have identified and that we're starting to organize uh, you know, project charters and, and all that about. And one of them has been in flight for a while because we've known this, um, this to be a, a need, um, but the need has become more acute through the Futures 2 initiative. Uh, we'll, we'll be uh, refreshing our website this summer. Um, there, there's gonna be some key new design principles that you'll see uh, when we do finally uh, launch that new website, but we have to reach people in new ways. Um, and again, we've got some momentum on this one uh, to begin with. So we hope to be able to show uh, value in how we're change and how it is we're differently communicating uh, the value. Yep, I think we're gonna be right on time, Mark. Uh, activity two uh, is provide foundational IAM guidance to the community. So this goes back to that notion of uh, don't create all that knowledge and disseminate it to yourself. Create all that knowledge and disseminate it to a lot of people who need it. Um, serve the army differently. Acknowledge that the army uh, exists. Activity three is one that I'm really excited about. Um, you'll see why. Um, it's engaging the, the teaching and learning with technology focus, uh, 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 um, dimension of campus light, life uh, differently than we ever have. Uh, in the past. There's a lot of pressures acting on institutions of any ilk, public or private, large or small. Uh, the demo demographic cliff is real. Um, we're already starting to see evidence of that. Um, 
you know, nationally with the closure of some campuses. But most interesting, interestingly to us is campuses coming together to work together differently to, um, to abate some of the risks associated with the changing demographics of the nation and the world, quite frankly. I mean, it's, it's, this, this isn't unique uh, to the United States. So how is it that we can take the infrastructures and tools and capabilities that, that we've developed and aim all that goodness at teaching and learning enterprise. That's really exciting to me because it kind of completes and is complementary to something that we've historically done and we were founded to do. Um, sort of the or or origin DNA of In Common was to support uh, scholarship associated with research, not just you know in in the classroom kind of thing. Uh, and so one of the the uh, the place that we want to put our crosshairs in the su improved support for research is to uh, sell ourselves, if you will, it's a little bit, that's a, a bit of a strong verb, but sell ourselves a bit to uh, uh, federal agencies of import uh, to campuses, federal agencies uh, like the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, NASA, NOAA, Department of Veteran Affairs, State Department, uh, U.S. Um, Department of Education, um, all have very similar problems in ter terms of having thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of faculty, staff, and students at institutions needing or, and wanting to gain access to services that they, that they provide. Um, we've made a lot of, uh, we've had a lot of success, made a lot of progress in being able to play a role for the National Institutes of Health in this regard. And we think it would be really helpful to those agencies and also to the, uh, the higher education institutions that connect to those agencies to get more agencies into the In Common Federation fold. The last activity stream is really kind of a, it, I don't wanna say it's a catch-all as much as it is an acknowledgement that we have to fundamentally shift the way we think about community engagement, if nothing else, to achieve the outcomes associated with that one example that I gave, right? So. We need to, it, and it's hard, right? We need to step back away from what we've done for the last 20 years. So we've had a lot of success, but in order to get there, we can't do the things that got us here, right? Uh, so th this one's gonna, is the most nuanced. Um, this is the one that's gonna require, I think the most research and the most discipline, um, but we're gonna, we're gonna head into this um, space as well. So for those of you looking at a, a clean screen, um, you can hit that um, QR code and download the full report. It's also available uh, on the internet2.edu and incommon.org uh, websites. I might also, uh, some of you might be interested, even though we're, you know, we're in the thick of spring now, uh, every year in February or so, we publish a year in review or an accomplishments report from the year before That'll give you an idea of what we did last year and what the community did for itself last year. It'll also reveal um, how it is we did those things. And one of the things I'm looking forward to is how the how changes in our 24 year, year in review, our 25 year in review, et cetera. So this is gonna be one of the ways I'll personally be measuring is are we reflecting differently uh, on the year prior? I've mentioned this a few times, but if you didn't know, In Common turns exactly 20 years old in three weeks on May 7th, uh, early next month, In Common will celebrate uh, its 20th birthday. Uh, and we are done uh, with our presentation and we're now at your disposal for any questions that you or, or comments that you might have. I'll make a comment if Nobody else is jumping in to ask right now. Um, so, so kind of my diagrams and information kind of at the beginning was, you know, I'm I, I kind of think very broadly about this this stuff and what identity is. And there was a, you know, I think part of my excitement about maybe about doing a futures too was that there's not any. I could think of so many things. I could translate into so many particular charges to so many different groups um, that we could, you know, we could easily be overwhelmed that I was, you know, really wanting to have this help figure out what should we do and what shouldn't we do? Because not all things are equally easy and they don't all have equal benefit. And I think a lot of the stuff that Kevin talked about is a really good kind of start for this to help shape what we're going to do. And I like 
kind of the five year kind of ramping up um, where we're going to be kind of discerning and as we go to figure out what we should and shouldn't actually be doing. Um, there's just, there's a lot of variables and complexity in this community. And I, I'm pretty happy with the approach at this point. Well, I don't know about the rest of you, but that's a relief for me, given that, that Mark's the chair of the steering committee. Mark is light on his feet, so I don't mind asking him a question that I have never asked him before. So brace yourself, Mark. Um, because I, and I've been thinking about this, and I haven't, I haven't come up with an answer for myself. So it, it may may in fact even be unfair. But I have found myself recently thinking about the about the the first report, and you know what the outcomes were associated with it, right? The difference that that report made, and I'm trying to imagine, uh, theorize um, what it is the impact of this report would make. Um, the context for the reports and the time is just so, so, so very different. Um, but have you been thinking about that along those lines? Like, like what, what would we want to look back on? I mean, we can't wait 15 years to do this again. But, you know, if, if we get to an end of a five-year cycle and we want to look back, do you have any, like, obvious hopes that, that you hope we get to um, or accomplishments that we might hit? Well, I, that's, I think that's a really hard question. And I think if you look back on the previous report, there were a lot more simple, concrete things in there. And I think that, the, you know, what we're talking about now is um, so much more complex and it impacts so many more things that that's a little bit difficult to answer. Um, so, I mean, I can give a little bit of a watered down answer that, that um, you know, I think that certainly um, increased participation in these various communities and the increased use of the, the tool sets and the services is, is one thing that would be a potential um, that I would see as success and definitely not a loss. Um, and then also potentially probably a flip side of that is it more intense involvement, right? So you could have casual participants, casual use, but uh, more intense use of these things and, and to solve real problems that people are having on their campus. So maybe another way to say it is, uh, you know, if, if you're going to maybe try and survey it, uh, increased um, satisfaction with the value proposition that the in common and the tier tools have to offer to the institutions. Um, but I think it's really, it's really hard to give a, a really solid answer to that. I, well, obviously I agree, because I said I couldn't answer it yet myself, yeah. and I've been thinking about it for a bit. I do want to build on uh, the one thing you said. I, I had a, a public speaking opportunity a couple of months ago, and I, I mentioned the report. You know, we have the report. We're, we're working our way through it. Um, we weren't quite as far along as we are now. and And one of the slides I threw up was were were pictures of things that were born in 2004. And it, I mean, maybe everybody on the call already knew this or committed it to memory, but the Facebook became Facebook in 2004. Um, that's that's not necessarily an IAM thing, although I don't know about you, but every time I try to log on to something, I have an opportunity to use my Facebook ID. Um, so much of what exists in the solution space today was not even the, the, a glean in a venture capitalist's eye in 2004. I mean, it is breathtaking how much more complex the landscape is relative to how simple it was. Um, it was a wasteland uh, back in the early 2000s. And so now plotting a future uh, with so many other parts, moving parts going on it is indeed a bit uh, complicated so, so we got a question we'll go ahead mark go just just one other comment on that in terms of success i think the other thing is that you know if there are some novel uses that really are impactful that we're not anticipating today but but our work could actually turn out to be leveraged for some of those other things i think that's going to be a sign of success i think we're at the level of complexity that if we're you know working on this and moving in the right direction there are going to be problems that we could use this stuff to solve that we hadn't even been thinking of. And if that actually is happening, that's also another measure of success for us. 
Go ahead. So you want to do the question in the chat? Well, I was going to I was going to answer uh, uh, April's question. Will the in common futures two work be um, applicable to institutions of all sizes? And uh, my answer to that is an unqualified yes. Um, if 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 I went all the way back to the slide of you know one of the very first slides in the first act, you know this is what we do, right? Base camp, camp A camp, Edgerome, certs, trusted access platform, et cetera. Um, our events, right? Anybody can come to this. Anybody can come to base camp. Um, anybody can come to camp and A camp. You just might not like it, right? I mean, it, it, it takes a while to get to the point where, right? You need to achieve a, a certain level of a uh, sort of identity awareness, um, I think, to get the full benefit out of A camp. Uh, but base camps open to every, open to everybody. Everything's open to everybody. Um, so we do have an entry point there. I think a challenge in better serving smaller institutions is making it easier to use the tools, making it easier to connect to the infrastructure. Um, it's the part embedded in the futures to work is making it easier for those institutions to do those things as well. I personally think that if we make that shift in the knowledge we create and it's this dissemination, we will end up increasing the reach of our impact, even if we don't have uh, new institutions or new kinds of institutions connecting to the to the infrastructures themselves. So I think the opportunity, if, if we if we really deliver on this shift, this 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 uh, existential shift of who we are and why we're here, we will serve more institutions and the institutions we have been serving better. Uh, Dan from uh, Lehigh uh, asks, has there been progress in deploying identity assurance levels? It's hard to tell how well they're being deployed. Well, my answer to that question um, is indirect because I, 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 I don't personally know enough. Maybe someone, uh, one of my colleagues on the call um, could, could better weigh in on that. Um, and this will have to be our last question. I need to turn it over to, to back to Gene for, for some wrap up. Um, but we do, there is work ongoing right now with some of the, remember that big slide I had with all those names on it? Well, there's a, there's a handful of people in, in the, the menagerie of, of committees who are doing a mapping. And I think I heard last week that the mapping is done. The mapping of, of NIST LOAs, right? So the definition of LOAs onto how it is LOA is deployed in a variety of contexts so that we uh, we all, at, you know, the royal we, those of us who do identity and access management, um, have a sort of roadmap for uh, if, 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 if you're going to achieve um, a posture of asserting levels of assurance in a particular framework, you'll have a good handle using that schematic, have a good handle on what that means to those other contexts. So we've created or a tool is being created so that you can kind of walk through how, how your implementation of asserting levels of assurance will work with a variety of service providers in a variety of uh, service contexts. I hope that made sense, Dan. And by all means, um, I meant to put my email address. Maybe somebody could throw it in the chat window for me. Um, very happy to entertain questions uh, afterwards. Uh, you can just send them to me and, and I'll play traffic cop or if I can't answer them myself. Uh, but Dan, I'll try to do my best to uh, send you a link to some work that's ongoing. Uh, uh, in that space. All right, um, Mark, I'm going to turn with, with your uh, permission, I'm going to turn it back over to Gene for a little bit of wrap up. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks, everybody for coming. And uh, Gene, back to you. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, Kevin and Mark for that amazing presentation and giving us another uh, go at where in common is heading. Very uh, insightful for sure. And thanks to all of you who uh, attended today and listened in. We appreciate it. And thanks for those questions as well. Uh, very much appreciate you being here today. Um, just a couple things before we sign off today. Uh, there is a quick four question survey that you're gonna see as you exit today. So please do provide your feedback. 
and your input because we really do want to know what you think about these uh, webinars. Um, and if you have ideas for future webinars, we sure want to know about those too. So maybe you're sitting there thinking, hey, I have something to present. Or maybe you have a really great idea for a future session that you want to learn about. Um, your suggestions are definitely welcome, so please send them our way. We hope that you will join us next uh, month for the IAM Online in May, which is going to be another great program. And this time it's going to be focused on IAM 101, and our speaker will be Grady Bailey from UT Austin. And it will be a perfect primer to Basecamp, our Basecamp event. Um, speaking of which, next slide, Kevin. Uh, Basecamp is happening. So we hope to see you and your team uh, coming to Basecamp this year, which is taking place from June 3 through 7. It's virtual. Uh, so if there's anybody uh, on yourself or your team included who are new to IAM or perhaps new to this in common community and where we're heading and want to be part of it, or just want to get connected to other peers who are going through the same things you are, uh, Basecamp is definitely the place for you. So registration is open and you can learn more details at that link below on our website. So we certainly hope you'll come camping with us. Thanks again, everybody. And we will see you next month.